Welcome back to Econ 104, Introduction to Macroeconomics. In today's video, we're going to be taking a look at central banks and primarily at the Bank of Canada here in, well, Canada, of course. Uh, if we look back in the previous videos, we've been taking a look at money, we've been taking a look at bonds. The natural progression from this is, okay, we've been taking a look at money, cash, and financial instruments. Well, let's take a look at the institutions that assist us in holding on to that cash and assist us in buying and selling these financial instruments. So taking a look at banking is where we're going to go next. And today, Central Bank's Bank of Canada. So what's our goal as we move through today's video? Well, to start off, what we're going to do is we're going to explain the primary roles of the Bank of Canada. Why do they exist? What do they do? We'll take a look at the organization, the basic functions, and some ins and outs, some basic kind of overview of our central bank. What we'll then take a look at is we're going to take a look at explaining the relationship between the Bank of Canada and the private banks. That'll do us for this video, and that will segue perfectly into the next video. Uh, the next one in the series, we'll jump over and we'll take a look at the role of private banks. So that would be right in Canada, we have our big six. We have National Bank, Royal Bank of Canada, CIBC, TD, Bank of Montreal, Bank of Nova Scotia. Uh, I think I got them all. We also, of course, have our credit unions, our treasuries, our case populaires, all of those. Okay, I'm getting ahead of myself. All of that, that will be the subject of the next video, and we'll take a look at the role of these private banks and how important they are to the functioning of our, of our macro economy. But again, right, we were getting ahead of ourselves. Let's jump over and let's talk about the Bank of Canada to start us off. So let's start off by taking a look at the organization of the Bank of Canada. So we'll start off by taking a look at organization. Okay, so heading the Bank of Canada is the governor of the Bank of Canada, who currently is Tiff Macklem who is appointed jointly by the Board of Directors for the Bank of Canada, as well as Cabinet, right? So the current sitting government, their, uh, their Cabinet is going to be working in conjunction with the Board of Governors in order, sorry, the uh, Directors of the Bank of Canada to appoint a Governor. Now the appointment of Governor is for a seven-year term. And here in 2021, Tiff Macklem is pretty early into his term still. He has just started off in this new position. Okay, so a little bit of oversight, a little bit of, okay, who's the big head of it? Uh, beyond that, let's get into a little bit of uh, history, and in that we'll kind of get at the roles and the functions of it as well. So the central bank, interestingly, uh, the central bank here in Canada was not initially nationalized, that it wasn't initially part of the government. In fact, historically, in early days of Canada, the central banking duties, so issuing money, dealing with the government, all of this, these were actually shared by private banks. So that is, these were shared by Bank of Montreal was one of the first, and right, we can go through a few of the other lists, RBC, TD, Bank of Nova Scotia, CIBC, et cetera, et cetera, right? Is that these chartered banks, they actually shared the role of being central bank at times taking turns to actually be like, okay, we're going to do private or we're going to do central banking duties today. And then a few years we'll switch to the next one on and on and on. Well, okay. This was actually fairly common globally to witness, but uh, then policymakers kind of started to realize, uh, kind of post great uh, the Great Recession, or sorry, the Great Depression of the 1930s, or dirty 30s, is that really how much power central banks could have, and how much influence they could have over the greater macro economy. So what began to happen is a nationalization of central banking duties, and so what we see here in Canada. We see in the 1935 Bank Act a nationalization of nationalization of the Bank of Canada and the creation of it as we see it today. 
So let's talk about what exactly its roles are then as a central bank and its relationship to government. And the thing is, is to be honest, the Bank of Canada, I'm going to abbreviate that as the BOC, the Bank of Canada, it has immense power. It has immense power and influence over our macro economy. And this is this is most, I shouldn't say most, this is pretty much all central banks. The power of central banks is pretty, pretty amazing what they can end up doing to tinker with the macro economy and the impacts that it has. The interesting thing is that the Bank of Canada has this immense power, this massive ability to manipulate or to influence our markets and our economic situation on whole. And they... Really, for the most part, they are uh, they're separate from the sitting government. Um, they're not entirely separate. The word for it is that the Bank of Canada operates at arm's length from government. Right? And by government, right? By government, I don't mean all the bureaucrats. I don't mean everybody who's a public servant and is serving at you know the will of the people and all that. No, no, no. By government, I mean the elected officials, the actual party who has formed government and is our policymakers. So our prime minister, the prime minister's cabinet, and all of their members of parliament. That's what I mean by government. So not all the bureaucracy attached to it, because the Bank of Canada is bureaucracy, but rather the actual sitting members, the elected members of government. And so what this means is that the Bank of Canada is actually operating Day-to-day -day operations, for the most part, separate from government. The government has very, very little oversight in the day-to-day -day operations. So, right, I kind of said all that, but let's just say, uh, apparently I like this word today, immense, they have immense autonomy over their day-to-day -day operations. That is, they don't need to go to government. They don't need to go to the Minister of Finance every time they need to do something, every time they want to do something. They don't say, hey, do we, do we have authority to do this? Can we do that? Nope, nope. Bank of Canada is free to act as they wish. The only thing with it is that they are, right, and this is going to be kind of contradictory, they are ultimately, right, it's not like we just created this public service and just let them loose with no accountability. Um, they are ultimately accountable, uh, accountable to the Minister of Finance. So they are ultimately accountable to the Finance Minister. And what this is, the way that this works, and I'll kind of get into it a little bit as well here, is that the Finance Minister, as well as with the Board of Directors and the Governor of the Bank of Canada, and right often maybe the prime minister is involved in the entire cabinet, but definitely the minister of finance, they get together and they determine what is the mandate, what is the purpose of the Bank of Canada in influencing our greater economy. They come up with this mandate, they issue the mandate to the Bank of Canada, and the Bank of Canada says, great, we will go fulfill that mandate. And we will go fulfill it and just leave us be we have our job, we will do it. Don't micromanage us. That's, that's essentially kind of the idea, is that you've told us what to do, leave us alone, let us do it now. And that's really what we mean, that they have immense autonomy, but they're still answerable. This is kind of one of those boss situations, right? Where your boss really trusts you, knows you can do a good job, says, hey, I need this task done. That's all you're working on for the next seven years. Get it done. And the boss hardly ever talks to you or only talks to you if a big situation comes up in the meantime, right? That's kind of our idea going on here. Still answerable, but you have incredible autonomy over your actions. Okay, there is still kind of a check and balance here. As of going back, what was that date? Since 1967, we would say that the Bank of Canada has operated under joint responsibility uh joint responsibility between the finance minister and the governor uh governor was up there tiff macklem so what does this joint responsibility mean well it means that ultimately 
well, the Minister of Finance, he's or she's the boss, right? But there might be conflicts of interest. There might be situations where the finance minister is saying to the Bank of Canada, we want you to do X, Y, Z. And the governor goes, that is against our mandate. I don't think that's in the best interest of the people. I don't agree with this. Well, there is room here for the governor to disagree with the Minister of Finance. Hopefully they can work that out internally. But if not, well, the governor can publicly resign. And, well, you can imagine if that there was the case that his current sitting government was trying to manipulate the independent central bank, that the political and the market fallout from this would be quite, quite devastating. So in that case there, it's kind of one of those things where the Minister of Finance could push an objective onto the Bank of Canada that the governor and the board of directors disagrees with, but to a degree it might be political suicide. So there is kind of built in this safeguard to say, hey, Minister of Finance is the boss. They can still influence and can still push the Bank of Canada. But if there's disagreement, if there's disagreement, the governor can essentially flip that kill switch and pretty much end the political future of that current sitting party, right? It would be a very, very politically disrupting event if this occurred. And it, it never has, right? But it's there as a, as a safeguard, just in case, to kind of prevent this political, political meddling in the Bank of Canada. Okay, so that's a bit of background information, a bit of insight as to, uh, I guess, some of the institutional and regulatory and legal sides of the Bank of Canada. Let's switch gears a little bit and go and talk about the four basic functions of the Bank of Canada. Why why do they exist? What do we what do we want them to be doing for us, right? What's what's their main purpose for existing? So we'll go functions of the Bank of Canada. Again, BOC is my abbreviation for Bank of Canada. So the first thing, the first function of the Bank of Canada is going to be currency management. Okay, so currency management, what exactly do we mean by that? Well, they're going to be really determining how much money is in circulation. They're going to be printing banknotes. They're going to be really responsible. And this is since the Bank Act. So what was that, 1935? They have been responsible for issuing all legal tender. So your $20 bills, your $5 bills, $10 bills, $50, $100 bills, all of those are issued by the Bank of Canada. Interestingly, well, this is actually not, uh, I guess we're almost pushing 100 years now, but this has not always been the case. Interestingly is that Bank of Canada has only had a monopoly uh, monopoly on legal tender since 1945. That is, it took almost a solid 10 years after the Bank Act for the Bank of Canada to buy back all of the banknotes in circulation issued by all the different banks that were out there, buy back all of that, and issue their own legal tender. And so you might, have, you might have caught on to that there. A little bit of a trivia, kind of interesting bit of Canadian history is that pre-Bank Act, actually pre-1945, every bank issued their own currency. You would have banknotes issued by the Bank of, or by the Royal Bank of Canada. You would have, that's RBC, right? You would have banknotes issued by Bank of Montreal. You would have banknotes issued by CIBC, and on and on and on. Every bank would issue their own banknotes, and these were all considered legal tender. Now, okay, you get, and again, just going to go down a bit of a historical aside, is you get really interesting things happening with this, is that as a result, you don't necessarily always take every bank's banknotes at face value. Sometimes you don't trust a bank. You don't trust that a bank is actually going to honor what it actually says that banknote is worth. And so, Hey, $20 banknote issued by small town bank XYZ, maybe you only take that at $10 face value compared to, say, an RBC banknote. 
So you got a lot of really interesting frictions and uncertainties happening during this time. But since really modern times, 1945 onwards, the Bank of Canada has maintained and has had a legal monopoly over all banknotes. So all current legal circulated currency is issued by the Bank of Canada. As we talked about historically, is that till 1967, these banknotes, right? So these notes, banknotes, were redeemable for gold. Right? And keep in mind, right? We talked about this, is that historically, money was backed by weight in gold. That, hey, $20 would be able to buy you so many ounces in gold. And so that is, is that, hey, up until 1967, when it was completely decoupled, you could, in theory, take a whatever denomination bill, go to the Bank of Canada and say, hi, I would like to redeem this $20 bill for X ounces of gold. Okay, so that was there, that existed. It was actually never, ever acted upon. No one ever actually redeemed banknotes for gold, but it did exist. And in fact, if you ever find an old banknote, and I'm talking like pre-1967 banknotes, so these are getting increasingly difficult to find, they will actually say on the bottom, redeemable for gold at the Bank of Canada. So yeah, a bit of interesting aside. Nowadays, nowadays, bottom of your banknote, it just says legal tender, right? It just says, yep, this is worth $20 because we say it's worth $20. So bit of a bit of interesting aside there. Okay, so that's our first function of the Bank of Canada, ultimately to manage our currency, to manage our money supply altogether. What's our second function? Our second function is funds management. Funds, I'm going to abbreviate management to MGMT. Don't want to write that all out again. So funds management, what exactly do we mean by this? What we mean by funds management is that they are the banker to the federal government, right? So, hey, just like maybe Royal Bank of Canada, RBC is your bank, or maybe a credit union is your bank. They are your banker. Well, federal government is dealing with millions or dealing with billions of dollars. It would be pretty unfair for them to pick a private bank to say, hey, here's a bunch of money. Hold on to this for me. Be my banker. Right. That would give immense market power, immense amount of capital to one private bank, allowing them to dominate the others. It would create massive market problems. As a result, the Bank of Canada public bank, they act as the banker to the bank or to the government of Canada. So in that, what exactly do they do? Well, just like your banker, they will provide advice. And in this case here, they are providing advice on federal government or sorry, to the federal government on issuance or buyback of debt. So say the government wants to issue a whole bunch of debt to finance a new project. Well, the Bank of Canada will tell them how they could do that. And very similarly, if the government is running a surplus and is considering buying back some of that debt, paying it off, well, the Bank of Canada will again advise them on that. And this, again, just like your bank, the Bank of Canada will administer uh, the government's debt. So they will administer the government's debt. That is, they will take care of it. They will deal with the payments, the interest payments out to everybody who owns government debt, and they will take care of all of that. Finally, and this is a relatively small one, which in 104, we're not going to spend a ton of time talking about. Unfortunately, it is an interesting bit, but they will also manage foreign exchange reserves. So foreign exchange reserves. And that is just the reserves that are being held all together. How many US dollars are being held in reserve? How many euros are being held in reserve? Is on and on and on. Right? And this way here, this can have the impact of influencing our exchange rate altogether, depending on the reserves being held. But again, more of a conversation to be had 
down the road, we will touch on it slightly when we talk about our exchange rate regimes in upcoming videos. Okay, so funds manager, that's their second big role, their second big function. Third one is our third role is that they are a stabilizer. Stabilizer of the financial system. Of the financial system. So one thing that Canadian banking policy really values is stability. And we value stability a lot more than we value efficiency or competition in the banking system. And in this case here, this stabilization, this maintaining of stability in our banking system is crucial and a big role of the Bank of Canada. So what exactly does this mean? Well, part of it is that the Bank of Canada will act as a lender of last resort. That is a lender of last resort. This is essentially, well, hey, underneath funds management, we said that they are a banker to the federal government. Well, as a stabilizer of the financial system, they are a banker to the bankers. That is, say, TD runs into a whole bunch of financial trouble and they need a loan in order to maintain liquidity. In order to meet their day-to-day -day obligations, they're in trouble. They're not going to go bankrupt, right? But they're just, they're in short-term trouble. In the long run, they look like they'll be fine. But today, they ran into cash flow issues. Well, Bank of Canada will look at the situation and if they deem it okay, they will act as that lender of last resort. They'll say, hey, TD, is anybody else willing to give you money? Oh, no one else is willing to lend you any money? Okay, we will step in and we will lend you some money in order to provide you the liquidity you need so that you don't go under, so that you don't disappear. Because we value stability more than we value that efficiency or that competition in the market. And arguably, that's, that's a good thing. That stability in banking is arguably pretty vital. Additionally, in this stabilizer of the financial systems, they are also going to be an overseer, an overseer of our payment systems. So our payment systems are our ways that we transfer money between each other, massive amounts of money flowing through this daily. This is just even, hey, our check payments, our debit card payments, our wire transfers, our e-transfers, all of that gets processed through a massive payment systems network. And the Bank of Canada oversees this just to watch for irregularities and to watch for any kind of red flag alarm bells that might kind of signal that we might have some destability coming, some instability coming. Maybe that's a better word for that. So they oversee these payment systems, again, to be able to act, to be able to step in as that stabilizer. And of course, attached to that, again, we're going to take on that they're the banker to the federal government. And by being the banker to the federal government, they get to use the federal government's funds in order to help to stabilize things as well. And I'm not going to write that one down because we already kind of touched on that in our funds management side. So I'm not going to throw that in again. Okay, our fourth function. Fourth function is that they are the enactor. of monetary policy and this will be our big one that we look at in this 104 level is how the central bank enacts monetary policy what monetary policy really is and how it ultimately influences our macro economy and we'll see that hey but the way that they do this is of course through the other ones as well they do they do interrelate there so an actor of monetary policy so what exactly is this? So what the Bank of Canada does is they utilize something known as open, uh, we'll write it out the first time and then we'll abbreviate it, open market operations. And again, we'll abbreviate that as OMO. They utilize these open market operations to buy and sell bonds. By buying and selling bonds on the open market, they can influence the interest rate by influencing the price of those bonds. They will also end up influencing the money supply. As the money supply and the interest rate change, if we go back to that whole view of our liquidity preference framework, 
changing money supply, changing interest rates, that will filter through to affect economic performance. And they will do this in order to achieve their mandate. So, okay, what exactly is their mandate? Well, their mandate, going back to 1991, is when the Bank of Canada first adopted this mandate. And it renews every five years. And this mandate, building a little bit of suspense here. It's like, hey, what is this mandate? You keep going, okay, renews every five years. Wow, okay. They're building, we're building up to this. Uh, they, this mandate of the Bank of Canada renews every five years, determined again jointly by cabinet and our board of directors and the governor. So, hey, 1991, that's 2021. That's the next time that this mandate is being renewed. And currently, the mandate of the Bank of Canada, here we go, we're having it. The mandate of the Bank of Canada is to target inflation. So, to target inflation. That is the mandate since 1991. They will utilize their monetary policy in order to target inflation and to keep it at... A targeted rate, annual rate of inflation of 2%, allowing a little bit of wiggle room there. So plus or minus 1%. So that is, okay, Bank of Canada is allowed to have inflation run as hot as 3% or as cool as 1%. But the idea is, is that inflation, annual inflation is maintained at 2% per year. If we look at it historically, uh, the Bank of Canada has actually done a pretty good job at this. And let's take a look at that. Let's take a look at the Bank of Canada and let's take a look at really what inflation has done since 1991. So let's jump over and take a look at a graph here showing, uh, showing us that. So what do we have here? We have year over year change in the consumer price index. I don't have it all the way to current period, but I have it till 2015, so not, not bad. It's honestly doesn't look that much different if we tacked on another five years here. But what we see with it is, okay, percent change. So I say percent change, but these are decimal numbers here. So 0 0.03, that's 3%, 6%, 9%, 12%, right? And then all the way down to 0% there. So what, right there, that line there is about 1.5%-ish, something like that. This line here, uh, unfortunately, that line just put itself there as the average inflation over this entire time period we're looking at. Not really a point of interest to us. What is of interest to us is that we witness the, well, relatively really high rates of inflation through the 70s, through the early 80s, into the 90s. We hit 1991 here when we adopted inflation targeting as our main goal as hey this is what we want to do role of the bank of canada mandate of the bank of canada is to keep inflation between one and three percent and you see oh they've done a pretty good job right inflation has approached three percent a few times but has not exceeded it there's been a few cases where inflation has dropped down below one percent but typically it has been maintained at above the one percent level these cases where it's dropped below our 1% level, these have been cases during pretty severe recessions. So our dot-com bubble crash in the mid-90s, we have our 08, 09 financial crisis, right? In these cases here, we experienced recessions, we experienced deflationary price pressures, and we saw falling prices. Well, we shouldn't say falling prices. They were never negative, right? We never had negative inflation rates, but they were approaching zero they were approaching zero on this annualized term. So we see, yeah, Bank of Canada has been pretty successful at maintaining their mandate. Interestingly, right, so this here, this idea of targeting inflation as our mandate, as the role of the Bank of Canada, as a role of a central bank, this is, well, again, only since 91, relatively a new policy. This actually started with the Bank of New Zealand in the late 80s. They were the first to adopt this inflation targeting. And then since then, many central banks realized that, hey, you know what? That is actually a pretty good policy to adopt in order to ensure some economic stability. Bit of a uh, bit of history there. Pre-91 or pre-late 80s with the Bank of New Zealand, 
many central banks, they either targeted exchange rate regimes or typically they targeted some idea of full employment. Full employment. And the idea there being that, hey, because we can change interest rates through the money supply, right? Money supply, interest rates, buying and selling bonds. That was this open market operations. We'll take a look at it explicitly shortly, right? You don't have to go, oh my goodness, what? how does that all work through the monetary transmission mechanism? We will take a look at it. Through the monetary transmission mechanism, through their open market operations, it used to be that, hey, we're going to target full employment. That is, we're going to target unemployment to be equal to potential, sorry, unemployment equal to the natural rate of unemployment, meaning that, hey, GDP equal to potential GDP. With that, however, though, we saw that monetary policy was used to push down unemployment, push down unemployment, because it was really difficult to figure out what exactly is that natural rate? What exactly is potential GDP? Keep in mind, these are ideas. They're actually very difficult to quantify, right? Sometimes we can get a pretty accurate idea, but ah, they're not always perfect. The result of it is this targeting full employment. Well, as we push down unemployment, well, pushing that down ended up stimulating the economy more and more and more. And by pushing down unemployment, by stimulating the economy, we created inflationary pressures. Right, and, and we see that, we see that here in the late 70s into the 80s where we had these record high rates of inflation through this full employment targeting. Is that we were stimulating the economy to reach this idea of full employment. The stimulation of the economy was then pushing up wages, pushing up wages, pushing up prices, more money, devaluing the value of money so that, hey, every dollar is worth less. You need more dollars to buy the same thing. Whew. All of that pushing up prices, causing inflation. Since then, we've adopted this now inflation target. We've recognized that high inflation is problematic. High inflation erodes one of those functions of money as a store of value. It creates extra frictions, extra trouble into doing business. Slow, low, steady, predictable rates of inflation are very beneficial, are very, well, they're just stable. We know we can form expectations about the future. As we can form expectations about the future, I know what my money's worth. It's now a store of value. I can make long-term plans because I'm not worried that my money is going to drastically change in value. So all of these great things and big kind of results of this new realm of monetary policy. Interesting aside, Bank of New Zealand kicked off the world into this new kind of view of, hey, we should approach inflation targeting. And I should say this was this was not well received at first. There was many, many people who reacted negatively to this and criticized this policy as being terrible and that it would wreck the economy on whole. Well, it's turned out pretty well, but a lot of criticisms. Bank of New Zealand, again, being... Well, relatively small nation, relatively flexible bank is again potentially leading the way in a new way of dealing with monetary policy. They have just adopted, rather they've just been pushed to adopt as not necessarily part of their mandate, but one of the things that they want to look at and include in their targeting of inflation, they also want to include the impact of monetary policy on house prices, on real estate prices, on shelter prices. That is, New Zealand, as with most of the Western world, has witnessed this asset boom in real estate since right about early 2000s, late 90s. So one of the things that the central bank has said is, hey, well, sorry, the government has said to the central bank is, hey, monetary policy very likely is playing an impact on this. We want to ensure that real estate is affordable to some degree in the future. So all future monetary policy, yes, is to target some level of inflation, but it also has to be tacked on there as to how your monetary policy will influence real estate prices. 
And so a lot of interesting discussion as to how exactly that will work as we move forward and what exactly the ramifications are of it. It's a little bit short of a mandate. It's not saying, hey, real estate prices, inflation of real estate prices has to be maintained at some level. No, 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 no. Currently all it is is just saying, hey, when you engage in monetary policy change, you also have to include a write-up as to what you predict this will have an impact on for real estate. So that's getting into a direction that might be helpful. Uh, again, maybe there's a lot of criticism with this as well. A lot of criticism like what we saw when inflation targeting was first adopted. Okay, so a lot of aside there. Let's wrap this up. Our last bit to talk about, our last bit to talk about is to look at our relationship. Ah, uh, helps if I use the right tool here. We'll take a look at the relationship between the Bank of Canada and our private banks. And so in this case here, as we said already, the central bank acts as that banker to the banks through the regulator of the financial system. So, okay, that's the first thing. That's the first thing is that they are the banker to the banks. And truthfully, in this sense here, when the banks have, right, hey, you have a bunch of extra money, where do you put that money away on deposit? Well, you go to your bank and you say, here, put this in my savings account, put this in my checkings account. Same idea with the banks. They have their bank account at the central bank, at the Bank of Canada, and they take their excess money and they put it on deposit at the Bank of Canada. That's kind of where they put their money on deposit. So again, Bank of Canada is the banker to the banks. Through all these daily interactions, right? And again, just like you deal with your bank daily buying and selling stuff, same idea. All the private banks, they deal with the Bank of Canada daily. And through all of this, the Bank of Canada is able to influence our money supply and interest rates, utilizing our open market operations. And ultimately through that, they are able to enact their monetary policy. Okay, we're building up, right? We're building up how exactly do we do this monetary policy? How exactly do we fulfill our mandate of keeping inflation at 2% plus or minus 1%? We'll get there. We'll get there. Okay, well, that's really it for this video of taking a look at our central banks, just kind of an overview as to the role and the functions and the relationships of the Bank of Canada. In the next video, we'll be taking a look at the private banks. We'll be taking a look at the role of the private banks and how fundamental the private banks are to the workings of a functioning modern economy. Once we have this kind of overview of the Bank of Canada, the central bank, of the private banks, and we have them each in their independence, we can bring the two together and view how the Bank of Canada is able to monopolize on this relationship with the private banks to enact monetary policy to target inflation at their 2% plus or minus 1%. So we will get to this monetary policy, but we won't have a chance to really explicitly talk about it for another video or so yet. Okay, if you have any questions about the Bank of Canada, about the central bank, please feel free to reach out to me. You can post on the comments below. You can post on the D2L message boards, or of course, feel free to send me an email. Thanks, until next time.